but we don't know them as people like ourselves, our fellow human beings. It is our purpose here tonight to take a small step toward bridging that gap. For we must bridge it if we are ever to achieve a worldwide peace and understanding among people. So therefore, it is my pleasure to introduce to you not the headline in the newspapers, nor the face on the television screen, but the man. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel John Glenn. Thank you. Thank you. Ralph is one of the, uh, well, can help if we turn it on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's always nice to have somebody around who knows about these technical things like speakers and things. <laughs> Ralph has been uh, either the top or one of the top photographers with Life Magazine for some, I won't ask you how many years, Ralph, but I know you were sunk in World War II and wound up hanging under some debris and a few little things like this, so he's been around for quite a while and was assigned to do most of the Life photography work on the whole space program uh, back when it started, so we knew him uh, uh, very well all through these many years here. and. I think Ruth was saying at dinner tonight, Ralph had more pages of pictures in Life magazine last year than any other photographer, so you know what caliber work he turns out, so glad to have you with us, Ralph. Well, when I was first asked to come and be with you here this evening, I asked uh, sort of the general nature of the program, was it a series or a seminar, and I was told that this was sort of a symposium type thing, a seminar or symposium, and as soon as I heard the word symposium, I was... I guess it had two reactions. First off, I accepted immediately when I heard it was a symposium. And then I was a little bit shocked to think that you and your colleagues in the school area here would be sponsoring a symposium. Because I don't know how many of you know the true meaning of the word symposium. But if you go look in your dictionary, so help me, this is true. You go look in, the, in Webster's dictionary, and the number one meaning of the word symposium is one, a drinking party, feast. <laughs> number two, in ancient Greece, a drinking together, usually following the banquet proper with music and singing. So I think probably we should stop all this foolishness and get on with the symposium myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll drink to that. <laughs> You're stealing my stuff. <laughs> I would like for my remarks this evening for a little while to set the stage for what I would like to consider the main reason or the main part of the program. And that would be a, a session where we have a dialogue back and forth, where you can ask questions of me, I of you, we can discuss things, not just on the space program, although that's fine if we want to go that route, but on many of the problems that we have today. And if I had to pick a, another title for my talk tonight, it might well be Dragon Pushers. Now, what would we mean by Dragon Pushers? Well, if we could go back to the time of Columbus and follow him down as he went aboard ship and could take this roll of maps he probably had under his arm, lay them on the table, and look at those maps, they had inked in all of the known world at that time. And in the unknown area, where we didn't know much about it, there were big dragons inked in, boiling pots of oil, snakes. And in a way, it's sort of symbolic, I think, that we could say man's whole progress, whether it's been in a geographic sense, like a Columbus-type exploration of this area of the world, or whether it's space, or whether it's going into the laboratory, new thoughts on religion, or whatever. It's been pushing back these dragons of the unknown, filling in the gap filling in the unknown that lets us then go ahead and take this information and make progress. How can we do things better? How can we design a better light, a better whatever, curtain, doorknob, seat? Every bit of progress comes from man's curiosity. 
Alexander Wallstetter said that this is what made man really different from the animals. He said that our biggest job in a democracy was to take this new information in whatever field and, quote, consciously shape events to the future. And I think we've seen more of this consciously shaping events to the future in the last few decades than any previous similar period in the history of the world. Now, one of the problems is that sometimes when we're making the most rapid advances in some areas, it's most disruptive, causes the most change, and in turn causes many other problems. And I wish we had time this evening to let everyone here ask or state whether what they think our top two or three problems are today in this country. And if we did that, I'm sure we would find such things mentioned as surely number one would be Vietnam, Cambodia, Israel, use the crime, election reform, cost, the ABM, inflation, education, pollution, the poor, elderly, the welfare, community, civil rights, faith, religion, politics, abortion, government, campus problems. Those are just a few that come to mind. So perhaps this time of greatest progress has been a time when we've created many of these other disruptions and, and problems along with it. Some of our polls have shown a growing lack of confidence in our ability to solve these problems. And we generate such hard felt and differing opinions these days that we almost wind up with different patriotic feelings. If we think of patriotism, well, we go back to our elementary school days and we think uh, Nathan Hale, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Stephen Decatur, my country may she always be right, but my country right or wrong. Right or wrong? That's a big order. My country right or wrong. A couple of years ago in New York, up along 8th Avenue or 6th Avenue, Annie and I watched while several thousand marchers walked 20 or so abreast on the way to Central Park chanting, hell no, we won't go. Hell no, we won't go. You talk to some of those people and they feel they're exercising a, a higher brand of patriotism by really thinking about what's going on rather than mindless acquiescence. We see bumper stickers, America, love it or leave it. And you talk to some of those people, and what they really mean is not America, love it or leave it, but really America, agree with what I think you should believe, agree with my political philosophy, my view of things, or leave it. And that's not quite what the country's all about either. I think probably my view of things might be best expressed by a statement made by a Civil War general in 1899, well after the Civil War, Carl Schurz, he became Secretary of Interior and a few other things, said his view was our country, when right to be kept right, when wrong to be put right. It seems to me that might better indicate my view of things, and if we had to design our own bumper sticker, might it not be America, love it, and help make it better? It seems to me that indicates a little more of the tolerance and the forbearance, perhaps, that we need. Well, we've made fantastic progress. We've created problems. Problems that give us even differing brands of patriotism. And I think perhaps the generation gap, if there is such a thing, is, is more of a communications gap than it is a generation gap, as was mentioned earlier in the introduction. I think before, however, the younger generation becomes too dissatisfied with what's happened and with some of the things they're most unhappy with that we have not solved in some of those problem areas I mentioned, perhaps it's good to drop back just a moment and think about what has happened within my own lifetime. And I don't claim to be quite so old that I encompass too many years, but within my own lifetime, I can remember as a boy of about eight or ten years of age, hearing my dad and mother discuss whether our we were going to lose our home, whether the mortgage was going to be foreclosed. And my dad went to work on WPA. 
Well, the point of this is what? Before we become too dissatisfied that we haven't solved all of our problems today, we better remember first that it's been just within some of our lifetimes within this room that this country, that, that we even had a situation then where we didn't know whether this country was going to survive in the community of nations or not. And while today we think it's a horrible thing, and it is, for 6% of our people to be unemployed, if we're in that, hap if you happen to be in that 6%, it's devastating. But in those days, within my own lifetime, it was a big event when unemployment got under 20%. A big event. So we've come a long ways since then. Well, what other, uh, we, we've made tremendous progress. We've solved many of our economic problems, even with the difficulties that we have today. We could measure the progress we've made in those last few decades in many, many ways to show what a rapid recovery and advance this nation has had, how rapidly this changing time period has been that's generated some other problems. But it has that thing on our uh, this emphasis on where we have come in these last two years, last few decades, does show our ability to consciously shape events for the future. There are many ways we could measure it, and I won't dwell on these things at great length. But uh, we one measure is gross national product. The whole world puts out about 2,900 billion. We put out well over 900 million, almost a trillion. We have a third of the output of the world's goods and services with only one-sixteenth of the world's population. Progress in those last few decades, we certainly have had it. Those big figures don't really mean much, because we can't fathom them. It's like, you know, we say in spaceflight we're going five miles a second. Well, that's very fast, but you don't really comprehend it, even though you've been there. Because there's nothing, no yardstick, nothing right close by to compare it with. But if we think that 11 northeastern states here with 375 billion output per year equals all of Russia, then it begins to make a little more sense. Perhaps even more so when we say that India has 575 million people. Their output of goods and services is about 40 billion a year. Where would that be equal? Well, my home state of Ohio has just under 11 million people. And it puts out 40 billion a year in goods and services. Um, it's just hard to believe these comparisons. The whole continent of Africa puts out 50 billion a year. Illinois equals that in this country. It's estimated China, with all their 800 and some million people, they don't even know how many people they have. They can't count them all. They put out about 80 billion a year. It's estimated, and California equals that in this country. Fantastic progress. Other measures? Well, it's estimated our knowledge doubles every 10 years now. And I've, I've always been interested in who makes estimates like that, because I don't know how we can possibly make them. But I've read, I've read this in several different things. And uh, how we estimate our knowledge doubles every 10 years, I don't know. But even if it's off by 50%, it's still very impressive. And a better estimate, perhaps, of our rapid advance is that last year's, it's estimated that of last year's college graduates, just over 50% of them went to work in vocations that did not even exist when they were born, within that span of about 20 to 22 years. Communications, rapid advances there, well, it hasn't been too many decades, less than just about a century ago, we were trying to get one little spark cross country and messages were sent by runners and drums and pigeons and things. And now we watched last week while fellows were on the moon and you got your information back on the TV tube at the rate of about 100 million bits per second across the void of space. Big progress in communication. Life expectancy gone up tremendously during this 1919 to 69 almost a 50 percent increase work week is cut by a third with a 50 percent increase in output how many times anymore do we hear about people dying of diphtheria or typhus or smallpox or scarlet fever 
rarely. And we still did hear of those things, just when I was a boy. Better housing, went through a couple of wars, we started civil rights. All of these are measures of progress we've made during this, this last time period. Sitting out sort of on the end of this, this cutting edge of science, which has been at the heart of much of this advance, has been the space program, and I'll just comment on this briefly, and if we want to touch on it later, we can. There are several areas that the space program has fit in with in this area of very rapid progress. Some of the, the uh, services that have come out of the space program, for instance, communication satellites, some 6% of our global communications now go by, by communication satellites. And we've seen this across space and uh, broadcast from China, so on. We don't think anything of it now to tune in and watch a tennis match at Wimbledon in England or something by, by a satellite. The services area. Increased weather forecasting. Sure, we just accept that as routine these days. Pick it up on TV and see the weather pattern for our whole country. Probably the main reason for even having a program, though, is not that area, not just the services, not just the spin-offs that we get, and there are some 2,500 applications of those to industry and to our daily lives now. But the real reason for running a space program is the, the research, the new information that enables us to do other things. It's not just men in silver teddy bear suits jumping around on the moon or on whatever flight. It's research. And I think many Americans have missed the point of the whole program in that regard. I think too many people in this country have felt that this was just some big political drag race, some burnout with Russia to the moon, and we won, so why keep on running? And if that were the only purpose for having a program, I would probably tend to agree with it agree that it was, was wrong to continue. But the reason for having the program is the new information, the research, that lets us do other things, lets us do new things, lets us better consciously shape events to the future, as did experimenting with electricity, say, in the past, or with steam engines in the past, or with the internal combustion engines of the past, or things like this that enabled man to travel to different spots, different areas. Well, along with this, we also have had some big personal experiences, of course. It's been quite a new vantage point for man to get out in space and look back and, and see Earth from a new area out here, from a new vantage point. Uh, people quite often ask, what's it like at launch? What do you think about getting ready for launch? And I think there's a standard answer in the astronaut group for that anymore. We ask a question in return. If you were getting ready for launch, how do you think you'd feel if you knew, knew you were sitting on top of that thing built by the lowest bidder on a government contract? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone hasn't been for the space program, of course. Dr. Von Braun told me about a, a letter he received shortly after my flight back in 62. And this little old lady wrote to him, and she just took the whole program apart. She berated him for having designed boosters. She, designed, she just took Bob Gilruth and the man's face end of things apart for having supervised the construction of the uh, spacecraft. She took the McDonald aircraft outfit apart for building that thing, and in particular reserved her biggest epithets for me for having gotten on that thing and gone up there. And she finished up her letter to him by saying, we had no business to be going up there. We should be staying home and watching TV like the good Lord intended. <laughs> <laughs> a little more corny one, maybe. Bob hopes that our greatest accomplishment was in medical science, the first time a capsule ever took a man. That's pretty, that's, that's pretty bad. But I think, apart from the space program, we've all this area, this, this whole generation of very rapid advance, 
has caused a couple of other problems. One, we've become extremely specialized. If we think of a colonial village and we think of the uh, man who grew the lettuce over here and the man who, the cobbler over here, made the shoes and somebody else was the buggy maker over here. And now we've gotten so specialized, our lettuce comes from California and our buggy maker is now Detroit and our cobbler is now a whole section of the country that the shoes come from. As we've become so specialized that uh, a couple of years ago when the drawbridge workers were going on strike in the city, you remember it stood fair to close down the whole industrial direction of this country almost and the, the economic life of the country because people couldn't get into Wall Street and some of the major businesses, business headquarters of the country. We were more vulnerable probably to a few drawbridge people going out on strike than the uh, North Vietnamese are to airstrikes almost. We're very, very vulnerable. We're specialized to the nth degree, and it does make us vulnerable. Well, the other thing is the rate of change that we find coming upon us. We no longer have a generation to assimilate new things as they come to fruition. There's much dislocation. We no longer have the solidifying influences nearly as much of home and family and community and church where a man grew up and lived most of his life. 20% of our people move to a new domicile every year. And 13% move across state lines, a major move. We're a mobile, flowing population. We've seen some of this mobility, this rate of change and specialization cause what you and I have witnessed over the past 20 years as the greatest migration in the history of the world. It's estimated that 18 million people have moved from farms into the cities because of the technical revolution where only just under 6% of our people are needed on farms now to give us surpluses of food and we pay them to keep land out of operation. And those unemployed on the farms have moved to the cities and have been at the heart of our, our inner city problems, our poverty problems, and our welfare problems. Which, about which we are so concerned. Well, how do we cope with this, with rate of change, with specialization? We haven't yet learned how to do this. In other words, we have not yet had a, a space program approach to these other problems, and this has been a big lack. And I think it has been at the heart of some of the dissatisfaction between the generations, if you will some of this communications gap that I referred to earlier. Because we, we, we just have not put the same emphasis on solving the social problems that we have on solving some of the scientific problems, and it has created an imbalance. And we do need more emphasis on that. I think the young people of today, contrary to what some people may think, really are entering our society from primarily a different base than any previous generation. And I travel quite a lot all over the country, and I've been in well, quite a number of colleges and universities in the last year and a half. I've spoken at probably 30 or 32 all over the, the country. And I think there are really three things that have impressed me that would probably indicate to me at least that this generation really is entering society from a different base than any previous generation. Number one, I think this is the first generation that's ever had the extreme emphasis on science that this generation has had. Now what's magic about that? Well nothing except that when I went to school, was in college, and we used the scientific method, the case study method and so on, it was applied to science mainly, to math and, and uh, physics and chemistry and so on, all the regular physical sciences. But now we are so accustomed to this emphasis on science and this way of thinking of things and this way of approaching problems that we're now teaching and students learning by this case study approach applied to philosophy and government and politics where you try and cut away all the sham and everything surrounding a problem and just see it as its clear center core problem, whatever it is. And if you use that type of approach, 
And you think about these different problems from the viewpoint of the younger generation, and you want to cut away the sham, and do we see much sham and hypocrisy and false front and false faith in front of things? Sometimes that's all we can see, I think. Religion, even. We're even taking sort of the case study approach to religion, comparative religions now, instead of just a, a church-related college, say, teaching its own particular viewpoint. We're now studying, looking at things from the other man's viewpoint, from what he believes and why. Uh, the young people of today taking this approach, when they're trying to cut away all the trivia and get to the, the heart of the matter, I think, are really being constructive, although it is disruptive once again. Religion? Does it really make any difference whether the priest has the right color skull cap on it with some particular part in the service, or whether the rabbi does whatever he's going to do at a certain part, or like a church I was in that's down near the Space Center Houston, Webster Presbyterian Church, where I was an elder in the church. We got a new minister once in a he wanted to change the order of worship on Sunday morning and take the offering up at a different time and sing the hymns at a different time. And this created a big division in the church as to whether we were going to permit this or not. And the church was about to have a big scrap over something about as insignificant as changing the order of worship on Sunday morning. Pure trivia. And this is what we're, many of the young people are turned off about. I don't think most of the young people today are any less religious than their parents were but it's taking much more of concern for the basics of religion, for the human relationship, than most of us had in, in previous times. Well, along with some of this trying, this emphasis of science and trying to cut away the sham and the false faith, the false front, along with this has, gone the, has come the advent in the last few, very few decades, just a couple really, of broad spread use, widespread use of television. Has this had an impact? We can read about Vietnam in the papers and read it in black and white and it's described, but you go home and turn on your television set and on the evening news, you see the man fall. You see the wound and it practically drips out of the set on your own living room floor. And this can't help but impress you. It impresses me, and I've been in combat, I've had wounded people, I've had blood on my own hands, helping people out with all the horror of that, and it still impresses me when I see this on TV now, it makes the hair stand up on my back, and I know I'm not going to have to go and fight. So it can't help but impress our younger generation today. This is a window on the world, and the same type window in the world applies to all different areas, not just sports and not just the comedy programs, but it really is an information source that no previous generation has had and has left them better informed at a younger age than any previous generation. So the emphasis on science, better information at an earlier age, and I think along with that has gone more of a freedom as the third thing to speak out because of the increasing affluence that has been built up over the past few decades. The young people of today basically are not as afraid of not making a buck as I was at that same age. Uh, they've seen the unions spreading money around a lot more. They've seen Medicare and Medicaid and increased Social Security. In other words, our, our, this whole economic system that has come to fruition in the last few decades that I mentioned has done a good thing. It's allowed them to speak out better, perhaps, than any previous generation. Now, some would look at things with the scientific viewpoint, of course, and say, well, uh, it's just too bad to fix, and I opt out, and I'm going to take my girlfriend, myself, and a sack of bananas. We're going up in a cave, and we'll live there, and you people in the valley can have it. And there's some others who say it's too bad to even fix up. We'll bomb it out of existence, start over as cavemen. But there's that 99% in the middle that just want to make the system work. As Churchill said, that uh, this may not be the best system, but it's better than any other one that's ever been. He said our, our system is the worst system, rather, except for every other one that's ever been tried. And I think that's probably right. 
We have not put the proper emphasis. We have not balanced some of our rapid advances in science and technology of which space is part. We have not balanced this with a like emphasis on some of the social problems we have. And I think basically some of the unhappinesses we see today are where we have expressed our ideals as a nation in school, in Sunday school, in Boy Scouts, in Girl Scouts, in whatever. We have said what this country stood for, but we have not met these things in reality. Does it make any difference today in this country what color your skin happens to be? You bet it does. We haven't corrected that one yet. We've made some strides, but certainly have a tremendous way to go. We could follow on with many examples, of course. But we need to match, we need to make our ideals a reality. If we are to have the future in this country, we know we can have taking the economic base that we've developed over the last few decades. Now, I'd like to pause here for just a little bit and uh, see if we couldn't have a little discussion here or any questions you wish to ask of me or vice versa here. And maybe we could have the house lights up just a little bit here, if you would, please, so we can see a little bit better here. Anyone have a question here? And we could... Yes. <laughs> yeah, that did have some problems, didn't it? <laughs> uh, but I think everyone heard the question all right. I won't need to repeat it. But I think uh, what he's referring to is on the right at the end of the first orbit on my flight or during the second orbit, uh, there was an indication to the ground through a telemetry signal that uh, the heat shield was loose. And, of course, on reentry, that could have been a bad, bad day all the way around. Uh, the normal reentry for a the old Mercury spacecraft, well, the configuration of it was, if this was the heat shield here, and we're, we're going to re-enter this direction, uh, heat shield is here, and there was a retro rocket package set right in the middle of that and was strapped back to the basic spacecraft with three straps. Now, after the retro rocket pack is fired, then normally it was jettisoned in space, and you'd re-enter the atmosphere then with a clean heat shield. Uh, and as you came on down then and the main parachute came out, when it came out, then this heat shield had some catches here that pulled, and the heat shield dropped about four feet on a big rubber bag, which then acted as a sort of an air pillow, an air cushion to attenuate part of the landing shock. Now, the signal that had been sent down from space was that even though I was still up there and still in orbit, that this heat shield, that the uh, hooks had pulled here and that the heat shield was loose. So we elected at that time to leave the retro rocket pack on in its position after retro fire instead of throwing it away in space so that it would help hold the heat shield in place if it was loose, uh, hoping that the aerodynamic force as I re-entered the atmosphere then would build up enough pressure to hold the heat shield in place. And uh, so that's what we did. Well, as re-entry started and this high heat built up, the uh, straps that held the retro rocket pack in place uh, broke and one of them flopped up in front of the window and so I knew that they had broken and it felt sort of a bump on the spacecraft and I thought the retro rocket pack had gone off into space. So a little later on during re-entry when these big chunks started breaking off and coming back past the window I wasn't, well I, there was a possibility in my mind that they might be the heat shield breaking up and uh, obviously I'm here they were not the heat shield breaking up it was the retro rocket <laughs> retro rocket pack that was still in place and it was breaking up then and burning and melting and coming back past the window. So it made for a few anxious moments on re-entry but there really wasn't anything to do but keep working and keep trying to damp out the motions of the spacecraft at that time and uh, do the best you could and work right on through it. But uh, I told uh, oh, Al Shepard after his recent lunar flight that uh, there might be a lot of re-entries in the space program, but I didn't think that from the astronaut's viewpoint there would ever be one that looked any more spectacular to anybody than that one I, I had as the first flight with these chunks breaking off and, and coming back. It was pretty spectacular from there. But fortunately, it was the heat sheet. I mean, it was the uh, retro pack. Yes? 
No, it was a false signal to the ground, and I had no indication it was loose in the spacecraft either. I did not have any signal there that it was loose. But it, uh, there had been a telemetry signal sent to the ground, which was a faulty signal. Yeah. Uh, would you have uh, stayed in the space program if uh, you hadn't had that accident damage? The well, question is, would I have stayed in the space pr program had I not had the accident that damaged uh, my inner ear for about a year? Uh, well, I was already getting out of the program at that time. I had stayed in some uh, couple of years after the program and had done everything I felt I could contribute to doing. After my flight in 62, Bob Gilruth, who uh, ran the program until just a few months ago, uh, felt that the upcoming flights at that time should go to people who were, would be available for use on the lunar landings later on. And at that time, we felt those would probably occur in, oh, realistically, 1970 or 71, and that uh, I was, as the oldest of the first group of astronauts, I was going to be at or beyond 50 years of age by the time these early landings occurred, so uh, it didn't appear to be good career planning or, as he put it, it would probably be more wishful thinking than anything else for me to stick around as training as the world's oldest permanent training used astronaut. <laughs> so so uh, he was encouraging me at that time to accept a management position and, and uh, stay in in that capacity. I decided there were some other things I wanted to do, and so... I left at that time. I, I'm very sorry I wasn't younger when the program started. On the other hand, I feel very fortunate to have come along with when the, uh, well, to have taken part in the program at all. So uh, you uh, have some pluses and some minuses both directions by what you do. Yes. I knew we should have stopped this one question sooner. <laughs> Well, first, on my uh, political efforts, I'm, I guess you'd say, and I don't want to be politically weasel-worded on this, but uh, let's say I am inclined that direction at the next Senate race in Ohio, which is up in 74. Uh, I can't say for sure what's going to happen in the next year in which I have to make up my mind, but uh, uh, I think it's obvious from just from what I've said here. I haven't lost interest in maybe helping work on some of the problems we have today, and I can't think of a better place to do it than the Senate if I could get there. But uh, whether things will work out right, particularly in the financial area, for me to run again, I don't know. I don't think most people yet have an appreciation of what it takes to run in a modern industrial state. The amount of money is just fantastic, uh, mainly for television. A TV is very, very expensive, and you don't charge that as cash on the barrel head before the program goes on the air for political candidates, and with good reason. And uh, <laughs> I tried, and they wouldn't let me. <laughs> but it's a uh, it's, it's a tough tough area, and uh, the money that's being spent is fantastic. Uh, we just we have to, one of the things that concerns me now is we have just passed election re uh, financing laws, new ones, in this past session of Congress. And I think most people feel they're somewhat protected now. And there is a degree of this in the presidential race itself. But for representatives, for congressmen and, and senators, it's a complete charade that we're any more protected than we were under the old Corrupt Practices Act, which never had a single successful prosecution in, what was it, 47 years, I think. Not one prosecution in 47 years. And the reason is that those people charged with checking on the corrupt practices outlined in the law are employees of the House and employees of the Senate. So you know about how hard they checked in 47 years. And it was very carefully, after much debate and much to do and many suggestions, much work, that particular provision was left in the new law. Now, it wasn't in the, the, the presidential races, they report over through GAO now. There is a separate commission. But after much debate, this idea of a separate commission to investigate those things was done away with, and it went back under the old system that the clerk of the House and secretary of the Senate 
are both charged with checking on their bosses. So you can imagine how far this new law is going to get. I think there are just many things that need to be redone in this area, and we just haven't scratched the surface yet on it, and it's very just getting drastically important. Uh, I, I just... I mentioned levels of confidence in government. There's a whole speech can be given on that that is uh, that I've worked out back not long ago, and it's a, it's a frightening thing. Some of this increasing lack of confidence that we have in our high government officials, and I don't say this as Democrat, Republican, or anything else. It's something that's been going on for many years. I'm a Democrat, but we had our credibility gap in the last administration, as well as the crisis of confidence, as we call it right now. And you can just give list that, just list whole lengths of things that where we say one thing and do another. And this is intolerable, particularly in this this time period in which we're living. I think. Well, you triggered me off on that one there. I guess didn't mean to give quite such a long answer to your question. Vietnam, what we do now, without going back into the history of it. I don't know whether you can give it without going back into some history of it. It's difficult because you have to explain why your own attitudes maybe have changed. I've done a 180 in my own thinking on Vietnam through the years. Uh, with most other people, some 80 percent of the Americans, I started out feeling that it was definitely a communist encroachment. That's it. Very black and white to me. Very clear cut. We should oppose it. We didn't have a military commitment to oppose it because the treaty that we had, uh, the CETO treaty and so on, was a moral commitment to discuss things and didn't necessarily bind us to military action. But we took that as a moral commitment to go in and help these people. Well, as we've learned through the years, it's been at least or more a civil disturbance between these people with some communist help for one side. But it's much more of a communist thing of them fighting each other, I mean, a, uh, a civil thing of them fighting each other than, than we had thought at the first. And incidentally, it's interesting that Ho Chi Minh, back after World War II, when he had fought on our side against the Japanese, came to us and wanted help for what he was going to do. We turned it down. He went to the communists and got help, which is rather interesting. So it shows that maybe the dedication to communism was secondary there to what they already had going in the country. Anyway, what do we do now? I think we're, we're in such a mess there now that I think the sooner we get out of there, the better. And I just, I think it's a... I can't... I hate to say it because it's going to be a, it'll be a black eye to us in some areas around the world. And it's a blow to our own morale, our own self-morale, and so on. But when we've made as many mistakes as we have, when we see a regime there that is, is not a regime that we can be proud of backing, and see some of the things that have happened there why I, I think we, uh, we're well advised to get out. The uh, current action where we somehow term this air increase as non-combat uh, sort of snows me. The, the, the administration today talks about we're, you know, indicates we're practically out of Vietnam because we're down to fewer ground troops. At the same time, we're escalating the air war back up to uh, heavier than anything it's been in the past. And uh, this done in the guise of protecting our troops on the ground just doesn't ring true to me. I'm sorry, but it just doesn't. Because if we're protecting our troops there, all we need to do is within a 24-hour period, we could have our advisors, who are the people we're protecting, they're scattered all over Vietnam with Arvin and with South Vietnamese units. Supposedly, these are the people we're protecting, and these are the reasons why we're bombing everything up north, and we're so worried about getting our people out. Within a 24-hour period, we could have all them back at one spot and really protect them. So that's what we're really interested in. But our major effort is not that. We're keeping our people there, the few that are left, we're keeping comparatively few. We're leaving them spread out with all the Vietnamese still, and as long as they're spread out like that, certainly we're going to have to take a much wider action which obviously is propping up the, the Pew regime. It's a very complicated thing, and I, it's, uh, we could get as many opinions on this as there are people in this room, I know, but I, I uh, uh, Scotty Reston's thing in the, uh, I think it was this morning's Times, had a uh, good commentary talking about how the president's really got himself into 
sort of between a rock and a hard place here because we previously wanted the Vietnamese to stop in position. They keep what they had, we keep what we have at a time when we were in pretty good shape. Now, as his question was in the editorial, what happens now if the North Vietnamese come back with this same offer now that they've taken about half of South Vietnam? last week or so. Can we in good conscience turn it down? I don't know. But I really feel we have to, we've, uh, I, I think that we've devoted some eight years, seven years, seven and a half years there. We've put untold billions of dollars into it. We've given them a thousand combat airplanes and 500 helicopters. We've trained them. We've had every training program running that we know how to give people. And it comes down now to my way of thinking that they either have the will to go at themselves or they don't, one or the other and we cannot prop them up forever. I think we've gone the last mile. I think we've done everything anybody could ever possibly expect another nation to do to help them. And they have to cut it on their own. We cannot be the world's policemen forever all over the world. And so I feel that uh, now that we've done that for them, I think that we should, we should get out and they either have to sink or swim. If after all this time they can't do it themselves, if we are to stay in there, that means we may be in for another 25 years if they have not learned or don't have the will to defend their own area with all the help we've given, all the training, all the equipment, then we can only assume that if we're to stay in and prop up their government that we're going to be there for a long, long time. And I don't think that, that uh, we should do that. What, what I've talked a long time on that. What's your opinion? Do you agree with that or you have some other idea? What should we do? About 50, over 50,000, 400,000 wounded, something like that. Anybody else have an opinion on that before we get on to another question here? Anybody else want to comment on the Vietnamese thing? Yes, go ahead. The PW, well, that's another one that doesn't ring true to me either. There, to my way of thinking, there never has been a, well, not to my way of thinking, history shows, there never has been a war in history that I know about or have read about where the prisoners were released during the war. And I think the best way to get the prisoners out is stop the fighting and get out, and then there won't be any reason for them to keep them. I, I just don't see that uh, to say that we're going to stay there until they release our prisoners, to my way of thinking, is the surest way to guarantee they will not release our prisoners. I don't, uh, must be a history prop in here someplace. Has there ever been a war where the, <laughs> where the uh, prisoners were released before the end of the war? Not that I've ever heard of. Korea? Well, no, we had a stalemate, though. It was all, uh, we were, well, like it is now, yeah. We had a stand down. Everybody is peace, even though we keep the front lines. And uh, then we go through Big Switch at Freedom Village, which I, I was there for that. But the fighting had stopped at that time. We didn't have any fighting going on. Well, that's a good question. Gosh, I hope we don't get into Vietnam like I don't have, I hope we're still not sitting in Vietnam like we are in Korea some 20 years later. Any other comments on that before we, yes. An immediate bloodbath if we just pulled out. I don't know. I have no way of knowing that. It depends on whether the South Vietnamese can defend themselves or not. I guess if there's an overrunning if they're completely overrun from the north, I don't know. And whether it would be any worse to go in the other direction, I don't know. Yes. Well, that's, that's entirely possible. I think if there's one issue, if there's one issue that could well upset the election this year, I think that's it. Yeah. I don't know why he can't see it. I, I, uh, he has top-level advisors and is supposedly has all the, some of the best advice in the world, but uh, I, it's just become increasingly confusing and increasingly unclear. Uh, I think the... Uh, if there's one thing that can upset the election this year, it is that single fact of the war. If he winds it down, if we truly are almost out of Vietnam, I think uh, the war will not be an issue. I think the election probably will hinge much on the economy uh, this year. But uh, 
I agree. <laughs> Other question? Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. What? Yeah. The question was on uh, the fact that we're supposed to be winding down the war, and as we're taking men out, we're also sending men back in. Yeah, we're, we're taking them out on the ground and, and still continuing that, but then increasing by some 30,000 about two weeks ago the air and naval personnel on station in that area in, in the uh, southeast Asia. The what? Have ground forces been increased? Oh, yeah, well, they're still turning people over there, if that's what you mean. I think the total numbers there are being held down and are being decreased, but men are still going to Vietnam, sure, because they're replacing men that have already been there for a year. Yeah, the regular, the, uh, regular service personnel who are in as career people, some of them have been there, th some of them are back on a fourth tour now. Oh. I don't know about that. She said that some men had been told they would not go back again, and now they're being sent again, and they'd already been there two or three times already. I wasn't aware of any of those, but yeah. Yeah. comment was that there's been a poll taken. Uh, I haven't seen that particular poll, but she said there was a poll taken that showed that 51% of the people approve of what's going on in Vietnam right now. I haven't seen that particular uh, one myself. That's very interesting. Yes. Okay. Okay, question is whether it's better to get out of Vietnam right now or whether it's better to wait until, uh, uh, to get out right now while they're invading and while they're pushing as far south as they are. Well, um, I don't, how are we going to push them back? The only way we push them back on the ground, if the, if the Vietnamese can't hack it themselves, the only way we push them back is to reintroduce Marines and ground troops and everybody else in there and start pushing north again. And I don't think most of the American people would stand for that at this point. And I don't think we should. I think we've invested a tremendous amount in Vietnam. We've put not just money, but lives, and we've put effort, we've put equipment, we've put everything in, and it comes down to the will to defend your own area. All the battering the North Vietnamese have taken, they obviously have the will to come down there. They're fighting for something. They have a purpose. And the all the training we've given, and I, I you know, I, it hurts me to say that we're not going to come out of that thing a clear-cut winner. As a Marine, I spent, my, spent 23 years in the Marine Corps. I went through two wars, Korea and World War II. And Korea, World War II was very clear-cut. Korea got pretty well clear-cut, and I think we're into a very hazy area now. And if we think we have made a mistake, and if we think that we cannot shore that up to where they can do it themselves, then can we keep on being the world's policeman? I don't know. What's our alternative? It just seems to me that we've gone the last mile. If after seven and a half years that they can't make it on their own, we're not going to be able to prop them up forever unless we're willing to assume that burden for maybe the next 20 years. We'll be uh, just like uh, Korea, except it'll still be active combat and all that length of time. Yeah. Uh, not to change the subject, but to get back to that beautiful place called space. Yeah. And that's your front yard. All right. I'm glad to get off Vietnam for a little while too. Uh, I think we, because we can. Uh, and that's ours too. Yeah. Uh, can you see any purpose in initiating a pursuit of Vietnam and maybe the Viking program to Mars? Now it's just vehicles. The Viking program is just vehicles. Yeah. Question is on the uh, whether I think we should go a man program to Mars right now. No, I, I do not think we should go man to Mars right now because it, it would be a fantastically expensive program. I think we have a lot more information to be obtained per dollar spent right here near Earth right now. Uh, 
We've gotten a lot of results from the lunar flights, and uh, many people do not know some of these things. All they've seen are the guys up in silver suits and gee whiz, and it's fantastic, and we come home and another parade, and that's it, and they've gotten tired of it. But what if we had a way of, of growing three or four times the rice in India? I'm sure that everybody in this room would, would applaud that. Well, I can't say that we have solved that problem yet, but some of the lunar soil, the lunar dust brought back, for instance, mixed, with, mixed in small amounts with earth soil, causes growth rates in corn and certain types of ferns and, and uh, moss four to ten times normal rate. And we don't know why. There's no indication of why. There's no trace element. There's no new element in this thing that we can't already introduce in soil. There's no radiation, at least of a type we've been able to measure, that causes this. Yet it happens. It's repeatable. There's the little corn. There's the big corn. The only difference is you sprinkle a little stardust on it, and there it goes. <laughs> now, if we can find out why, if we can find out what causes that kind of growth rate, can this help India solve its food problem for the first time in history or other, na other areas in the world where they have big problems? Uh, that's the type thing that's really at, at the reason why you run a manned space program. You can go up, you selectively bring these things back, you don't know what the, the uh, result will be necessarily. The serendipity of the thing. That's the reason you run any research, a laboratory, space, wherever. Certain of the lunar rocks, not all of them, but certain ones of the lunar rocks, when bacteria and microbes of a certain type are placed in the near vicinity, they die. And we don't know why this is either. No radiation that we know about or no airflow, nothing like that. And the National Institute of Health in Washington is interested in this now, and they're running some cancer. Some of their cancer study people are interested in this. Now, I don't know whether it'll have any effect on that or not, but that's the type thing that you get when you're doing research. It's the new information you're looking for. It's the reason why you're doing this. Now, what we have the opportunity to do now is bring the program back and set it up in an Earth orbiting program and ferry scientists and technologists back and forth and run literally thousands of projects that may be of much more immediate and tremendous benefit right here on Earth. That's the important thing, I think. And this is the shuttle, the ferry back and forth, or whatever you want to call it. Skylab, which will be a program run for a year and a half or so, will fit in between there, but, and it's been funded. The longer term space station has not been funded yet. But you do things back here oriented toward Earth that scientists want to look into. Uh, oh, weather control. Not analysis, but weather control. Van Allen, Van Allen, early in the space program, sent some probes up, found two radiation belts. Later on, we find out when the solar winds are at their height, when they're at their maximum flow, they come out, hit the Earth's magnetosphere, and the Van Allen belts are deflected to flow around the Earth in a big teardrop-shaped pattern. And when this maximum deflection is occurring, there's enough heating change in our upper atmosphere that it changes the paths of the jet streams at high altitude. And that's what controls our weather right here on Earth. Now, if we had had a little better control and could have changed those jet streams today, maybe I wouldn't have had to arrive in the middle of a downpour out here today. Or perhaps in Pakistan uh, a couple of years ago, we could have saved the lives of a couple of hundred thousand people. If we can somehow learn to alter this, course of events that we now understand. Uh, other experiments that popped to mind, well, uh, some of the scientists want to experiment with anti-gravity devices. We know that there's an attraction here to Earth. What's the opposite? We don't really know how to control this attraction to Earth. Can we somehow align polarities of molecules on surfaces or something so that we can at least partially repel as well as already as all the time attract? What if we could control that force some way? We never have found out how to really control it at all. Like with automobile, you let your imagination run wild, Buck Rogers-like, if you want to get into that anti-gravity thing as to what we can do. Uh, other, probably one of the most promising immediate fields that's available immediately is more complete exploitation of this Earth resources analysis technique, this multispectral analysis, it's called, where you take sensors in not only all the colors in the visible spectrum, but in ultraviolet, infrared, and other areas too, and you set up a sensor in each one of these areas trained on the same object down here. Now every item on Earth that is above absolute zero 
uh, has an energy and heat absorption or radiation pattern to it. And you train all these sensors and you get a particular result on a particular object on the ground in each one of these different sensor areas. Gives you a signature of the normal in those areas or a signature of what elements you are looking at on the ground. And you come up with such things as uh, Oh, results from passing this over certain areas of the world where there's been not as much exploration, you find oil fairly close to the surface, perhaps, or indications of water near subsurface in some desert areas. Or another one that's uh, intrigued me somewhat is uh, schools of fish out in the open ocean leave tiny, tiny microscopic amounts of oil behind them in the water. Couldn't even see it if you were there. But a spacecraft going over picks that up, senses it, can send the fishing fleets out to that area, tell them where the schools of fish are, and tell them what kind of fish they're going to catch when they get there by knowing the type oil. So these things are just in their infancy, and this is where you can have a fantastic payoff. Back, uh, the one Ralph was talking about at dinner. market had almost been wiped out before that, and that's just picked up off one picture. Corn blight last year. They were tracking corn blight cross-country with this thing, looking at cornfields down here and, and uh, able to tell the farmers, go out and check your corn if you haven't already, because it's probably starting to get the blight. Farmers go out and check it, and they could tell them to check it before a farmer had noticed it in his own field. And you can go on and on and on with this. The, uh, Pollution monitoring around the world. This is a cinch for a satellite like this. In the rivers and, and quite small streams, you can pinpoint any changes in pollution. And you can take one satellite with its coverage, its span, can map the whole world every 18 days by the inclination of the orbit here. He goes up and he's set up here in an orbit and the Earth turns under him and he makes a new path over the Earth as it every time he goes around, and you cover the whole Earth every 18 days. Here's your, here's your global pollution, <laughs> I can't even say it, global pollution picture every 18 days to compare with the previous time period here. So these are the types of things that you can do with the uh, Earth orbiting spacecraft and with scientists going back and forth, and you can expound on this. There are literally thousands of projects that the scientists want to run, and uh, I have a whole listing of them here that we could talk about for hours here if we wanted to. Yes? Go ahead. Yeah, the question is whether we can really monitor this and do something about it. Is there anything we can do about it, not just monitor? Well, the first step is to find out it's there, I think. And we need stronger environmental laws. I, I, uh, I've I, been quite active in some of that environmental area in Ohio. I headed up a, uh, a uh, citizen's task force on environmental protection that the governor asked me to head up in Ohio last year, and we spent about four months going into this as to uh, how we could cope with Ohio's pollution problems. and. We are rather unique in Ohio in the pollution area in that we have at least some of every kind of pollution man's ever been able to determine. Now, that's a dubious distinction, but uh, we wound up taking a cut at every single one of these things, and, and uh, uh, it's something we really do have to do something about. The first step, though, what I was impressed with, was the first step we have to learn where it is and what it is. That's something a spacecraft can do. Beyond that, our efforts as we're doing them in Ohio now, and, which, and this report is being used as some of the basis of current legislative proposals, uh, states can't solve this by themselves. It's going to require more federal action. We don't like to throw everything to Washington, but these are problems that blow and flow across state lines. 
And uh, we can put in a very tough law in Ohio, and all it means is that new businesses may be driven to Kentucky or Pennsylvania or Indiana, Michigan. So we're going to stop, the only time we're going to stop pollution being used as a political business football back and forth across state lines by either lax law or lax enforcement is when we have a stronger federal law, I think. If states can't wait, we've got to take action on our own, but uh, we must have stronger federal law and federally enforced, I think. Yes. Yeah, question about the uh, weightlessness problem in space and what well, it's a very comfortable feeling personally when you're weightless. The only problem it causes really is uh, in handling equipment and, and uh, uh, food, water, things like that. Ralph and I worked together before the flight on the camera I took, and it was quite natural when I was going across the Atlantic and was taking some pictures of the Canary Islands, and they called me from uh, Kano, Nigeria, to reset some of the telemetry switches, and it didn't seem at all unusual at the time, of taking pictures like this, and you just put the camera out here and let go of it, and you go ahead and reset the telemetry switches, and come back and pick it up again and keep right on taking pictures. And if, if we were all in a spacecraft here right now, if, if, uh, if I had a glass of water here and started to take a drink and changed my mind and stopped, the water would keep right on coming. <laughs> so you have to, uh, obviously, you have to keep these things enclosed. And uh, all the systems on the spacecraft have to be designed that way, too, because the fact that you have an outlet hole on the end of a fuel tank doesn't mean the fluid is going to run that way. It'll float around in globs inside the tank, and you need a piston or a diaphragm or a something to push that fluid over to the hole to make it go out there in the right direction so you can use it. So you have to design the thing with this uh, whole thing in mind. Now, as far as medical effects when you get back, if you get beyond a flight period of about four days, there starts to be a, an increased calcium loss in the body. The body begins to sense it no longer needs the same skeletal strength, apparently. So it starts shucking off some of the calcium, and best estimates are that this is around, over an extended flight, runs around 12 to 14 percent of the body calcium. Uh, right now, our blood tends to pool in the lower extremities or lower ab abdominal area, and the blood vessels, of course, contract and keep the right amount of blood up in the upper part of the body. Uh, if you ever had a lengthy hospital stay and been flat on your back for a while, you know that uh, in that position your body relaxes and when you stand up and start to walk across the floor, maybe the blood runs down and pools down here, your blood vessels are all relaxed. More blood's down there and you tend to black out. Well, the same thing happens in space except that the body apparently senses it no longer needs the same blood volume and tends to throw off far more uh, water and, and uh, blood volume than it normally would do. This rebuilds immediately when you come back to Earth, a 24, 36 hour period before the lower extremities get the good news that the flight is all over now. And uh, you readapt quite readily. And uh, those are the main things that have been found. Now, we've had a limited period. If we get on up to month long stays in space or this 54 day, why maybe there'll be some other plateaus that uh, we run into. Those are the main, main things that have been noted different. There have been a lot of little things, and there were many predictions before my flight back in 62 as to the dire effects of weightlessness and the effect on the different systems of the body. But if you think about the human body, it's almost designed for space. Every system on the body is a positive displacement system. When you swallow, if you try it right now, when you swallow, there's a wave action starts from right here behind your teeth, and your tongue forces whatever it is, on back into your upper throat, and the esophagus takes it, everything clear through your body is a positive displacement pumping system. Same thing with your heart, everything. I know when we were kids, I remember once trying to, somebody suggested we stand on our heads and drink water. Did you ever try that? And if any young people here tonight, I don't take any credit if you go home and drown yourself trying this, but. But you can try it and you or hang your head over the side of a bed and see if you can swallow uphill. And you do. It's no problem at all. You swallow and it all goes uphill. It's a positive pumping displacement system no matter what the body attitude is. So it looks as though almost every system on the body was practically designed for space flight. Couldn't have done better if we had the doctors engineer it that way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's what I just explained about the loss of calcium when the, uh, when the body apparently senses it no longer needs its same skeletal strength. Okay, when do I believe there should be manned exploration of Mars? I think uh, probably after we have more completely examined everything we can do near Earth. We know we're not going to have unlimited funds for space for a while. Uh, so, and when I don't think we should have. I, I was a little afraid of the euphoria that, accomplished, that accompanied uh, some of the comments immediately after Neil's flight uh, landing on the moon. Remember the president made the statement, this is the greatest day since creation of Earth. That includes an awful lot of days, as far as I'm concerned, and there are a lot of things that happen in there. And I, important as I thought that step on the moon was, I'm sure there were lots of days like the birth of Christ and a few days like that that uh, a lot of people feel are pretty important too. But I was afraid that some of these statements were going to paint some of our leaders into a box from which they had to, were gone to Mars, which the vice president called for. And uh, I was glad when the budget came out that he took a more realistic view and that we did pull back a little bit. Now, we couldn't pull the budget any lower than it was, or we, we weren't going to get any research at all. All we're going to be able to do is keep the doors open, and that's about it. So it couldn't have gone any further down and, and uh, still been a viable program at all. I think as long as we can run it to 3.5 to 3.7 level, then I, th I think it's, uh, we can do all these things that need to be done and at a, at a fairly cheap price for the returns that we probably can get. Yeah. Uh, do you think there will be any uh, man flights in between the Skylab and the uh, potential uh, space station flights? Think there will be any additional flights in between the Skylab and the potential space station flights? No, there are none planned right now. That's going to be sort of a dry period there, yes. When will commercial space take over some of this tax burden? Well, uh, as far as manned space flight goes, I don't look for any commercial use of this for quite some time because uh, as long as it remains as expensive as it is, I think it'll just remain pretty much a government project as it is now with industry getting the fallout from it, the benefit from it that way. Uh, I don't look for space flight to get very cheap until we discover some new energy source of some kind. Uh, some new way to, to lift these things. As long as we're saddled with the, the liquid fuel boosters we have now, they're tremendously complicated, they're expensive, they're heavy, and uh, flights are going to remain expensive to make. Uh, if some of these days we get a control on anti-gravity devices or whatever, uh, or some new fuel source of some kind, as we've made progress in the past, you know, from steam to something else to the internal combustion and liquid fuels, at that time, I think, then we'll have space travel become much more common. Yeah. Yes. The question was on uh, whether we couldn't get together with some of the other European nations that are interested in this, like uh, uh, ESRO, ELDO, or the two main the European Launch Development Organization and the uh, European Space Research Organization that has been a multinational effort, and couldn't we work together with them? Well, this has been suggested in the past, and they have preferred to go it their own way, uh, with the idea that there are so many fallouts to other segments of their industry from some new research like this that they felt would not be available to them if we ran all the program in this country, for instance. Now, we have cooperated with them. We've put their scientific experiments on our spacecraft and have put them up for quite a number of nations. But uh, as far as getting together and launching from Europe or something like that, they, they have wanted to go their own route. Uh, we could probably make some saving if we did what you're talking about. Yeah, well, in Europe it hasn't worked so far, only to a very limited extent, that's true. Yeah, we have most of the space scientists over here, that's right. But we've, we've cooperated to the nth degree as far as their scientists working with us and, and uh, submitting uh, scientific experiments to go on our spacecraft. Uh, this has been a very cooperative area.
Yes. Uh, Yeah, back when, uh, yes, the question was, when did we propose uh, to cooperate on booster development? We've invited the people out of ELDO, European Launch Development Organization, years ago. I was over there and visited some of their people back in uh, 66, I guess it was, in uh, Germany in particular, when they were trying to work out the uh, arrangements with, basically with England, that was cooperating with France and Germany. They were each doing different parts of this. And... We propose that they bring their people over here and we all work together on it right here. Yeah. Oh, it was not a sharing that we were going to do any launches from Europe or anything like that. No, no, absolutely not. No, I, I, sorry, I misunderstood you. No, you're right. Yes, no, no. <laughs> well, and now that we've had all our questions, let's go on with the last remark. <laughs> uh, well, some poor misguided leaders, I guess, is, your, is the answer to the first one. I don't agree with them on some of these things. They, they are not opposed to all the space efforts. Uh, McGovern has taken a harder stand against more of it than anyone else. Muskie uh, has... Uh, proposed no further expansion of it or anything. Humphrey has been for most of it the way it is right now. Uh, and their statements on these things, incidentally, have been rather weasel-worded, too. It's difficult to pin down exactly what's meant by any one of them continually. Uh, I have the dubious distinction of having been a musky delegate from Ohio, which was soundly trounced yesterday. So uh, I had... Our Ohio law on when you have to uh, declare yourself as a nominee to the convention, which I wanted to attend this year, uh, we have to actually file by February 2nd. So uh, uh, we made up our, we're running as delegates, those of us that wanted to run. Uh, we had to decide these things back in December and January. And uh, so I was running as a musty delegate. And uh, of course, you know what's happened the past couple of weeks in that regard. Kennedy's, Kennedy's future, I don't know. I just take Teddy at his word. He says he doesn't want to run this year, and I think he doesn't. No, not. I don't think he should. It's not up to me to say. It's up to him to say whether he wants to run. He knows his situation better than I do, but for his family situation, for quite a number of reasons, the events of the past of uh, two or three years ago being as recent as they are, uh, well, his, his whole situation, I don't think he wants to run. I think he's very serious about not running. And I, I think all the newspaper speculation that any other people are just as stalking horses for him, I, I don't think is right. Do you think he should run? Yeah, I was, right. Bob Kennedy? No, he was going to continue at the same rate. I had drawn up a position paper for him, which he had... Uh, agreed with completely that hadn't been put out yet at the time of his death. Now, I, I knew Bob Kennedy very well. He was one of my very close personal friends. I was with him in California when he was killed and I brought six of his kids back east the next day. So, uh, and we've kept close touch with Ethel and everything, you know, keep touch with the kids and all. But, uh, no, Bob, Bob wanted to put a lot more effort into some of our, our uh, funds for the inner city and for some of the poverty programs and some of the, the difficulty, particularly in education, he was particularly interested in that, which I still think is the best way of working our way out of some of these things. Until we get our educational problems solved in this country, we're going to be a long time solving a lot of the other problems. Oh, I don't, you, you could judge that as well as I could. I don't know. When you draw personal qualifications, that gets into a judgment of moral character and all kinds of things that I don't think I would be prepared to comment on at this point. He says he's not running, and I take him at his word. I don't, I don't think he is. Yes, way up. Yeah. 
What's it like in a space suit? Binding. <laughs> Gets to be a word. The ones we had before were pretty much like a, uh, they were tight fitting, they were very close fitting. They had to be because when they blew up, when you had five pounds per square inch inside, they became pretty rigid. And unless you had the cloth then right in tight, close to your skin, you couldn't make a break in it so you could move or move your hand like this. So they had to fit fairly tight. The ones now have these ring joints and movable joints that give them a little bit more mobility. But uh, the earlier ones were, were very difficult to move in once you had them inflated. Of course, we weren't getting out and running around like they are uh, these days either. We're going to have to close off the questions here very shortly. Maybe we can have another. Yes. Where is that? Where? Oh, right here? Where, where was the one over here? I'm very sorry. Go ahead. Think about the space shuttle. I think that's the way we should be going. I was talking about the space station that we can put up now. To make maximum use of the space station, you have to have a way to get back and forth to it. And I think that's the space ferry or the space shuttle back and forth is uh, the best way to ferry all these scientists and technologists back and forth so we can run all the different programs that I think would be so worthwhile. Yeah. See any uh, possibility of a woman astronaut? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think the only, the only, uh, what you're trying to do in selecting people for the program, you're trying to say on this mission we're going to have this job for this particular seat in the spacecraft to perform, and here's one for this one, here's one for this one. And on one flight you may want a geologist here and a expert in the spacecraft systems here and somebody else over here. And so far, when you've lined up these jobs to be done, the men have just been better qualified than the women. Uh, we've started out with military test pilots. Well, nothing against the women's flying ability, except there just aren't any women test pilots, that's all, uh, that were as highly qualified as the men. And the same thing is applied in the area of geology or whatever the other selections have been. But some of these days, when they're looking for a particular specialty area and a woman is the best qualified, why, sure, she'll be chosen, and there's no reason why a woman can't go into space. You're going to apply, that's the... <laughs> yes. Last week, two students Yeah, I respect the views of both. I agree. I tend to, some of the violence that accompanied some of the student dissent about Vietnam of a year or two ago, I think was, was uh, not constructive. It seems to me if we already have too much bloodshed and too much killing in the world already and too much in Vietnam, why do we add to it here by beating people up and being unhappy and blowing people up and killing people here to add to it? To me, this is the sheerest kind of nonsense that we show our unhappiness about killing and, and personal uh, pain and suffering by adding more to it. Now, peaceful demonstration to show our unhappiness, certainly. If they want to go out, if, if you want to get a group together and signs and placards to show that there is a very deep concern about this thing, fine. I'd back those people up completely in whatever they want to do. But when we let some people de deliberately move in and foment trouble and throw bricks and break things to show their unhappiness about brick breaking and breaking and bodies breaking in other areas, doesn't to me make sense. I respect both views, but I, I just think it's a... I cannot go along with the thought that because there is killing and suffering in one area, we have to cause destruction and killing and suffering in other areas here to show our, our unhappiness with it. Uh, that's tortured logic to my way of thinking, but I, uh, those who hold their views that they want to stay out of, well, whatever, I don't see that you really accomplish anything by staying out of class myself. If you want to demonstrate, I don't see why it has to be done during class period. You can make this as much of a demonstration after class as you can during class. I think some, some, <clears throat> you know, possibly some of those that, uh, well, well, I'll say it anyway. Uh, 
some of those who maybe wanted to stay out of class and demonstrate hadn't read the lesson that day anyway. So. <laughs> Let me close with uh, a few remarks here, and then we'll go on up and be available for any comments anyone wanted to make a little later at the, I think we're having a little reception or something up here a little bit later. As I said before, I think many of the, where we have, many of the concerns of the people today, old and young, together, this isn't a thing where we set old against young, young against old. We're all concerned about these problems. No person here, whatever his age, is any more concerned about trying to see that we solve these things that are problems we mutually face than I am. So it's not a generation thing when we come to facing these problems. We're going to solve them because we all work together. But I think we've seen a swing in the last few years to not only the past interest in a world of order, but we're seeing also much more emphasis now on people's interests in a world of justice. And there's a big difference. And I think we want to see the ideals that we have expressed in this nation become a reality. Curiosity, dragon pushing, how to do it better, well, it's given us a fantastic material progress in this country, and the space program has been part of it. And we don't want to wipe that out. We don't want to stop all material progress, because this has been what has put this nation ahead. It's given us a better standard of living, by and large, even with our problems than anywhere else in the world that I know of. We're the first nation in the world that has ever really had the time and the substance to deal with some of these problems, to make ideals a reality. The time of Thomas Jefferson, work week, about 80 hours a week. The time of the Civil War to now, our work week has gone down about 10 hours per week every 30 years. My son and daughter, mid-20s now, by the time their working years are over, they probably won't be working more than a 20-hour work week. Now, this is the first time any nation in history has ever had the ability to produce all the goods and services that provide the opportunity for all of their people to live a good life and get on with solving some of these things where our ideals have not been met in reality. Thomas Carlyle. Motto, State University of New York, let each become all he's capable of being. Stated that as an objective for our country. Let each become all he's capable of being. Not, not unless he's black, or unless he's Jewish, or unless his hair is long, or unless his hair is short, but each person, just by his birthright as being in this country, can become all he's capable of being. That's quite a challenge to us. It's going to happen because we all got interested in it and did something about it. It's not going to happen because we, like Humphrey, McGovern, or Muskie, or Nixon, or Agnew, or somebody else. It's going to happen because we, as the people right here in this country, finally got around to doing these things. We can have some leadership, but it's going to come because each one of us had an interest in it. Because we take part in public affairs. Edith Hamilton wrote a book called The Greek Way, and in it she said that in ancient Greece, a definition of idiot was one who took no part in public affairs. And I think that's pretty good. Indicates the individual responsibility, consciously shaping events to the future. We can consciously set up the situations where each person can become all he's capable of being. This individual responsibility, Whitney Griswold talked about man being apart from the animals and that he gets a spark and this is, it's something new, it's different. We don't get new ideas of how we're going to run our country or new ideas or inventions or anything else from a group. One person within the group has to think of something and it starts right there. 
And he used as an example, he said, could the New Testament have been composed as a conference report? Could Beethoven's Fifth Symphony have been composed by a committee? Could the Mona Lisa have been painted by a club? I heard a little more, a little more crude definition of it, perhaps. How many of you, have, maybe you've heard the definition of a camel? That was a horse that was built by a committee. We mentioned Bob Kennedy a while ago, and I'd like to close with this. Uh, brought Bob's six kids back east after he had been shot. And uh, that night after I had the kids in bed at Hickory Hill, I went down in the, uh, walked through his little library, and there was a book on the desk, and it was a book of poems and essays by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I picked it up and leafed through it, and Bob had the habit of making margin scratches, as many of us do when we want to little passage there to remember to come back to sometime. And there were only three little spots in the book that had margin notes. And one of them, I thought, spoke exactly to the situation that we had been at that time, and it certainly speaks to our, our situation today. We can talk about our problems, we get gloomy, some of our opportunities, tremendous. But times of greatest change are times of greatest opportunity to bend this twig, this new day we have, this new time coming, to go the direction we want it to go. If we but all take our individual responsibility and think about these things and work on them, whether it be the space program or the problems of the inner city or who we're going to elect president this year or whatever, it's going to happen because every one of us took an interest in it. There are times of great change. There are also times of greatest opportunity. This quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, I think, speaks to us across the years. He thought he had problems in his time. I think this also applies to our time. If there is any period one would desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution when the old and the new stand side by side and admit of being compared? When the energies of all men are searched by fear and by hope? when the historic glories of the old can be compensated by the rich possibilities of the new era. This time, like all times, is a very good one, if we but know what to do with it. And I think that's a pretty good statement. This time, like all times, is a very good one, if we but know what to do with it. We think we have lots of troubles. Well, we do. But if we just get busy and all of us work together in correcting these things, which we can and we must, I think if we give the same kind of dedication to solving some of these other problems that we gave, the same kind of clear-cut objective that we had in the space program, there's no doubt in my mind that we can do it and we must. Thank you.